Hi, I'm Mike Rothman and welcome to Song and Wine. This is our season four finale. Um, our last concert's coming up in a couple weeks and I'm joined today with composer, producer, writer, um, jack of all trades, Glenn Rovin. Nice guy. Yes, nice guy. Um, and he is one of the five composers that we're premiering works by uh, on May 21st, part of our New Voices series. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit today about the process of writing art songs. Um, but first, uh, I have to give a shout out, as always, to Waterfront Wines, who are on 360 Furman Street in Brooklyn Heights. And um, they always provide us with great wines. Um, you should check them out. They gave us an Italian red today, then Copa to Latino. And um, we're gonna give it a little taste. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, it's nice. It's Smooth, good, right? Yeah, they always give us really good wines. I'm gonna have a We have a whole bottle. <laughs> um, so to dive right in, um, Glenn, your your piece is three uh, songs on text by Thomas Hardy, and um, what drew you to Thomas Hardy? Uh, Britton is one of my favorite composers, and he said a lot of Thomas Hardy. Yeah. And um, you know, if it was good enough for Britton, I thought I I would try it too. Exactly. And my favorite composer who said Thomas Hardy is uh, Gerald Finzi, right? Who said a lot. That so that was my channel of reading a lot of Thomas Hardy's poetry, mm -hmm. which I think is, is is at its best very 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 fine, and it has I think he's different than a lot of other British poetry from that time in that he has a sort of almost the sort of cynicism mm -hmm. and this sort of hard edge to him that a lot of the other poets. Um, don't. If I said write art songs, I have one reason, to learn the poem better. Mm -hmm. And I find that the poem exists with or without me. So I love learning it deeply and learning the meter and, and not just reading it as a casual reader, but really setting it apart. And people say, and even you said it about my stuff, that it's accessible. And I feel what that means is that the poetry comes through, mm -hmm. that, that it's not obtuse and, and, and it's it feels like it belongs to be uh, sung. I think that's also important. I, I, it has to feel like uh, it exists as a song. Yeah, and it's interesting working with composers who are writing songs that whenever I get the finished product mm -hmm. of a great song and I look at it, it to me seems so logical and so straightforward of like how, how could you even have imagined setting it any other way? And then after the fact, I sort of hear the composer being like, oh, I, were, you know, I had to try 500 different things before I got it this way. And it's so it's sort of like, you know, I think song is very hard to compose well because it's so, it, it's so simple. And every decision you make is sort of naked there, right for everyone to see and pick apart. I, I agree. And, you know, you feel like there's, there's, if you made like a Venn diagram, there's, great poetry, mm -hmm. then there's bad poetry, mm -hmm. then there's great poetry to set to music, and then there's bad poetry to set to music. And those are four completely separate categories with actually very strange counterintuitive overlaps. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, because once a poem becomes music, despite what Strauss says, mm -hmm. it's the music that drives it. So that's why the poem can either be great mm -hmm. or crummy or not so great or medium yeah. great it, be, it goes into this world of the music um, if someone's writing a lyric that's so dense there's no reason to set it to music whereas if you have a, have a lyric like uh, loverly loverly wouldn't it be loverly yeah. and you read that on the page you'd go what? <laughs> and then all of a sudden you hear loverly loverly yeah. it's, you, I always think words need room for the music Yeah, there has to be a reason for this to be performed, in terms of it has to be a performance element with good notes for them to sing, yeah. and, and climaxes, and humor, and so, so that's a whole other thing. We're out of wine, so right. I should call it a day. But you should come uh, on May 21st, on Sunday, 
uh, at 4 p.m. at the Old Stone House. It's our new voices series dedicated to all songs from the 21st century. There are five composers being represented. Glenn, uh, Michael Drupstrom with his Three Teasdale songs, um, Ben Gunn by Scott Wheeler, which we premiered last season, uh, A Primer of Birds by James Kellenbach, um, who we've had on the New Voices series before with some other songs, um, Tom Chapulo's Rapture. This is the uh, public world premiere of a piece that I'm going to perform at my wedding, which is <laughs> the week before. Um, and uh, myself and Miyo Sugiyama on piano, um, Laura Strickling, Elizabeth Marshall, sopranos, and uh, Stephen Eddy, uh, baritone, and Pascal Archer on clarinet, because your work, we neglected to mention, is for bass, clarinet, and baritone. That's what the work is. Yeah, not for piano, which should be interesting. Um, Tickets are in the information. Um, check us out at www.brooklynartsongsociety.org. And uh, this is the last of our season, but we will be back with more wine and more song um, next October. So and, stay and tuned. Congratulations to Michael on his wedding. Oh. So let's let's do that. Thank you. Toast to Michael. Uh, toast. And to uh, till next season. Um, see you then. <laughs>